All right, welcome back to Pack West Bigfoot. This is David, and uh, I have to say real quick, um, thank you guys so very much for just being here. Uh, it is just awesome, and tomorrow I will be reaching out to uh, uh, the uh, lucky individual of this month's winner of a free prize, which is actually, if you watched the video the other day, it is one of those sunshade visor things for your front of your window in your car. It's a big one with big foot on it, so that's going to be uh, sent out to lucky winner. I'll get hold of you tomorrow. Um, also, I wanted to say sorry uh, for all of the uh, websites and blog and everything, all the interruptions last week, things running slow. It's just because there's just so many awesome folks like yourself out here, um, you know, listening in and visiting the blog and everything else that things just started running slow so I have had to uh, reach into my own pocket and I'm gonna have to upgrade servers get myself some of that VPS server uh, so uh, something more dedicated here with more space um, with that it is it is starting to um, cost me a little more time and a little more money so what I'm gonna do is ask ask you basically if you would like to help keep Bigfoot alive here at PacWest Bigfoot by donations um, I want to keep this website and all of its content for f uh, absolutely free for as long as I possibly can. So any and all donations that you can give here are greatly appreciated. You'll see a link here on the video for that. You can also go to the website packwestbigfoot.com. You can look up in the nav bar. You can look on the sidebar where it says donate. And please, I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's five bucks. I don't care if you give this week, this month, or just once a year. Um, as often as you can, whenever you can, and whatever you can is greatly appreciated. God bless you for that. Um, also, the interviews are still coming. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, one of the most popular um, encounter stories we've had on here was from Oric, California. And as a matter of fact, I have an, another individual from Oric, California, who had a couple experiences, two or three experiences, while he, uh, as, a, as a young man living there uh, with his mother. And uh, pretty interesting. That's coming out here shortly. Also, I've got a professional uh, uh, individual who actually works in the wilds of Washington State who would like to share some of his encounters, some of the experiences and some valuable information and uh, <clears throat> some, uh, I guess you could say, some evidence with us. So with that, let's get into this week's encounter story here on PacWest Bigfoot. Tow truck operator gets a Bigfoot scare on Highway 101. This one actually um, comes to me secondhand from a person <clears throat> who was uh, um, just you know, good friend of this uh, tow truck operator, and it's just, it was really uh, an interesting account. I really, really, in, it, it was really interesting. Oh, also, for those of you that are, um, you know, helping me kind of like, I don't know, <laughs> diss those uh, uh, little trolls on the old YouTube channel uh, because of me clearing my throat or sipping my coffee, thank you so very much for that. You don't have to do it. Don't worry about those guys. They ain't got nothing else better to do, apparently. But that's okay. I like sipping my Sasquatch coffee I get from Sasquatch Coffee Company. So, let's get to this week's encounter story. I finally got permission to share my story, and while I will not and cannot mention the company's name, I can share mine and the experience I had with Bigfoot one, one night while on the job. I can also share the vicinity of the encounter of my personal sighting. My name is Kirk. I am a tow truck operator. I have a license that allows me the tonnage to pull tractors, trailers, and what most call semi-trucks that get stuck or wrecked along Highway 101 in the Olympic Peninsula. <clears throat> this happened just over six years ago, near part of the Highway 101, close to a place called Oil City. It was winter, and there was snow, and... I was doing security one night instead of towing. <clears throat> Semi-truck goes off roading. It was not as rare as you think, yet at the same time, it is not as bad as the Coquihalla Highway up in B.C., but semi-trucks do go off-roading from time to time up here in Washington along Highway 101. Like any other state north of the old Mason-Dixon line, when the weather gets cold, snow can come, and that makes for hazardous road conditions when mixed with the salty sea air up here. Mix in some black ice and here and there and the low clouds and fog around the Olympic Peninsula, you have the making for a disaster, and we are known for some from time to time. <clears throat> this particular night it was the snow, the ice, and the Bigfoot that would cause a truck to slide off the highway 
in and up, into and up out of a ditch, flip on its side just short of crashing down a steep ravine and into the freezing water of a rushing creek below. The only thing that stopped that massive truck from going that far were trees, the tall, strong, and thick Coast Douglas fir kind of trees. It was hair past 9 p.m. when we got the call about this particular accident from the police. Uh, it would take me nearly a half an hour to get out there in the end, though the, the weather was so bad it really took me about an hour to get there. As a tow truck operator, being on scene allows you sometimes to be close to the action, enough to overhear what is being said by both the police and the rescue personnel, personnel not to mention those involved in the incidents or accidents. This particular one, however, seemed rather miraculous and hysterical, and both of them at once. Apparently, the driver was coming around the bend about 30, 40 yards back. That is when he said a giant or really tall person ran out in front of him, and he applied the brakes to stop. That is when he started sliding on the snow and ice and plunged over the side of the road and into the ravine towards the creek below. I personally thought to myself, who would be out here in the middle of the night running across the road? There was not a town or a house, for that matter, that I knew of for a few score miles or so from this location. Like the authorities at the scene, I think I even smirked a bit when I, bit when I heard the detailed account. Apparently he managed to make it out, called the police on his phone, and sat tight until they arrived. He was lucky, though. This was one part of the highway in this particular area that was very dangerous. On one side, you were okay with a ditch and a mountainside. The other was a 90 to 125 plus foot in some areas ravine that ended in an icy cold creek. Like I said, if it weren't for the trees, well, yeah, he'd be a popsicle before he could even call anyone. Bodyguard to the toxic. I was heading not out to uh, out not to tow a truck that night, but to stand guard over the site for the night instead. We in the towing industry have been known to do this from time to time. Besides, it would take two trucks to pull this thing out the way it sat. Apparently, that truck was on its side, and about 40 to 50 feet down the ravine and wedged between two trees. This means it was far too dangerous to drag it out and up, then tow it off in the middle of the night. It was just far too icy and foggy. Plus, it was not in the way of traffic where it was lying anyways. Not to mention the truck was hauling some toxic material that could harm the water below if it were to break open and spill out. So that was it. I was on guard duty. Nobody wanted to chance the thing ripping open in the dark if it could possibly be avoided. After the report was done and the truck driver would head back with the rescue unit, that left the officer and me at the scene. Of course, he did state that he could send someone up to check on me from time to time, but I figured I would be okay and kindly declined the offer for being babysat. Not that I think he was worried about the truck and its load. I think he was more worried about that the conversation I overheard about what the truck driver had reported. Some crazy person, or more likely a bear, running around out here might be an issue for me, I suppose. But I doubted the bear was still around, so did the officer. I also think we both non-verbally agreed that it, was, that it being a giant person was totally out of the question and just downright funny. After a few more minutes, the officer radioed in that he was leaving the scene and that I would be here just in case. He left, and the night became quieter and colder as the snow started to fall. If the trucks are rocking, don't come in. I got comfortable and let the truck run for about ten minutes or so with the heat on. I left the driver's side window cracked, and I mean barely cracked as it was cold enough to snow, and it was that night. It must have been at least an hour and a half before, uh, since everyone had left when I woke to what sounded like small pebbles or rocks hitting the truck. At first, I thought it was possibly icicles from the trees or even small pine cones or something else. However, once I was awake and heard one hit the door next to me, I decided to open the door and see exactly what it was. It was a small rock, more like a pebble that sat next to the door on top of the white snow. Was it there before? No could not have been. I had yet to step out of the truck where I had parked, and this new snow was still falling and undisturbed at that point. And it was a pebble, no bigger than my fingertips. 
It was odd, to say the least. What throws pebbles in a forest? Well, I guess that is why I was there, just in case someone or some individuals might want to take whatever is in the trailer of that truck. Maybe, whoever it was, they were trying to find out if anyone was in the tow truck itself, and at least that was a brief thought that ran through my mind. Immediately, I turned over the car, turned on the parking lights, and of course, turned up the heater for a bit. That would take care of the possible problem, I thought. Now, whoever it was, well, they knew I was here at that point, and like most tow truck operators, I was armed. The pebble stopped, almost immediately, although I only remember it happening happening twice. Before that, I was asleep, as I said. I settled back down, and this time turned on the radio for a few. The only station I could get was a public radio station, so I opted for the scanner. All was rather quiet on there as well. Eventually, I turned off the truck, except for the music. I turned the FM radio back on and fell asleep to the likes of some old composer from a long time ago. It was not to last long, before a half, uh, because a half hour later, the back end of that semi truck, the trailer that is, it was rocking back and forth all of a sudden. The sound woke me up. The squeaking of and the movement of heavy metal was easily heard through the windows that were still slightly cracked. And I'm not talking about heavy metal music. So instead of turning the truck, uh, so instead of turning the truck or car over and hitting the lights, I decided to use the flashlight first. This way, I might not scare off whoever it was and get a good look at them before they flee. I could not see anyone, and just as the light went on, the motion stopped and the trailer came to a standstill. Whoever it was must be dressed in all black or white. I thought. This time, I decided I'd better get out and take a look. I grabbed the pistol, the flashlight, threw on my knit cap, and then stepped out of the truck. I did not go far, like I said. That truck was down the side of a ravine, and I was not going to risk falling there myself. I flashed light everywhere I could, but nothing. I could not see anything nor any movement. I stood there for a few more minutes until I started getting cold, and then headed back into the cab to get warmed up. It was odd. First the pebbles at my truck, then the rock rocking of a trailer. A bear. That is what I decided whatever was rocking the trailer was. People being down there would not be worth the risk of falling into the swift and icy death of the freezing creek, creek below. Of course, the pebbles were still a problem in my thinking, but I let that go from my mind as I turned over the car for a bit again. I stayed awake for about another 30 minutes or so, but that music, well, it was lights out for me again. Face to face with a monster. I believe in Bigfoot because I've I've seen one. Uh, Have I ever been a Doubting Thomas? Well, yes, I admit that. And laughing at that trucker earlier that night, well, I guess the universe or God was making sure that the truth would win out in the end, I suppose. It was late now, well past 3 a.m., when I was woken by the scariest thing I would ever see in my life and a moment of fear I would never forget. I was in a pretty deep sleep, to tell you the truth, and being a pretty big guy, there were a couple of times where I woke myself up snoring. But what woke me this time was a different sound. It was a grunt or snort of some kind, and it didn't come from me. It was pitch black outside. The window was down a crack, and I mean a crack as in a quarter inch or less. And While it was the grunt that woke me up, it was the smell of something dead or rotten that really woke me up. My first thought was the trailer burst open and toxic, nasty, smelly sludge oozing out, (laughs) but that was not the case. Another grunt, and then I felt the truck move like it was pushed. To get this thing to move, though, well, you better be an elephant. Apparently, what I saw was close enough. I remember I reached down slowly to the floorboard of the cab and grabbed my pistol. I then reached over slowly and grabbed the flashlight as well. The smell was disgusting, and I practically gagged a couple of times. Whatever it was, I I could see its shadow all of a sudden right next to me outside the door. It was huge. Its chest and shoulders alone, I could tell from what backlight there was. They covered the whole width of the truck door. It was at that moment my heart started to feel the fear. Sniffing. It started sniffing and then gave another grunt. <laughs> through the crack of the window. That smell was its breath, a rotten, dead, carcass-smelling, pungent, gross nastiness. I felt like puking at that moment, but I couldn't because I knew I had to stay still. This was not a person. 
It was an animal of some kind. It was dark outside, but even what natural light there would allow me to see the outline of this massive upper body, and it was not a bear on its hind legs either. It had all the look of a person, and a large person at that. It stood erect for a few seconds, and I could tell when I tilted my head to look up at it slowly that it was at least seven to eight feet tall for sure. It pushed on the driver's side door again, making the tow truck and me rock. It must be one strong animal to do that, and to make the trailer of the semi-truck rock like it did earlier as well. It was at that moment that I felt I heard a slap or a whack from a hand on the opposite side of the tow truck. My gosh, there was two. My heart really started failing me at that point. I almost felt like I was having a small heart attack at the time. The blood seemed to have rushed to my head, and I, I literally fell across the seat of the truck, almost passing out. I did not get a good look at the one on the passenger side, as I just did not want to look anymore. I was frozen in fear. There were two of these things making the trailer move earlier, and now they were on either side of me. And when I thought to myself for a split second that I was out walking around and they were there, it made me feel even more afraid. Just when I started to catch my breath, though, this is when the one on the driver's side let out a scream I thought would shatter the glass. And then it would be able to reach in, pull me out, and pull me apart, literally. It was ear-damaging loud, I will always remember and I swear it made the loose things sitting around the cab, including my heart at the time, vibrate. The cab of the truck filled up again with the putrid smell of dead things, and I thought for a moment that that was likely going to be all this left of me in a few moments, just a bad breath. Looking up one more time briefly, though, through the driver's side window, I could not make out any real facial features other than the fact that these things were broad-shouldered, no real neck, and it seemed as though the top of the head came to a point, or at least cone-shaped. The guttural screams, the grunts, they all seemed sort of primatish to me. Not that I am an expert at anything but towing trucks, cars, or holding your seat for you at the Irish pub I wanted to be in at that moment real bad. But... That was all that I could make out as far as, these, as the features were concerned. It was looking in and down at me. I was not sure if it could make out or not or see me at all, but I got a feeling it could. After just a few moments of the stare down into the darkness of something massive inches, from the, inches on the other side of the glass, I could not do it anymore. I blinked. I looked down towards the floorboard, closed my eyes, and awaited my fate. I knew that if I had to, I would shoot. But I am not sure that was going to make any difference in the outcome for me. These things were huge. Another grunt. <laughs> and nothing. Not a movement, not a sound. Nothing for several minutes. I started to calm down finally and turned on the flashlight. There were some smudge prints all over the window. But they would disappear minutes later as the snow melted on the windows from the heat inside the cab. The smudge prints, however, looked like hands, by the way. Big hands at that. I was driving now, finally, albeit slow. I did not want to wreck and end up out here again at this moment with those things lurking around and me injured. I just wanted to get to a town and call for help. I was afraid to use the radio just in case I lost control of the wheel as well. Eventually, after 20 minutes or so of driving, I pulled over near a small market that was closed, but enough light for me to feel comfortable coming from it to actually stop the truck. I used the radio to call my dispatch, and they, in turn, called the local authorities, who came out and met me 30 minutes later at the market. It was the same officer as earlier that evening. I told him what had happened. To tell you the truth, I think he looked at me the same way we both looked at the truck driver earlier that night. Now I know what the truck driver felt like earlier while giving his account of how he ended up in a ravine. What happened simply happened, and I wanted him to know before he sent people up there or went up himself alone with those things out there. Either way, though, I said my piece and left it at that. Tow trucking in the city. I was done, and so was my heart after that. It was hard enough being a tow truck operator along that part of Highway 101 during any season. 
My heart just could not handle it any longer. And after thinking I was food or fodder for Bigfoot, well, that was the beginning of the end for me in that part of the world and with that part of my life. Today I'm in the towing industry still, but instead of big rigs down in ravines, I am pulling minivans in suburbs of Seattle. I like it here. Better. While it still freaks me out to even think about the situation I was in that night, and the images still making my heart jump, I do some research into these things on my spare time here and there, and that here and there, however, is always online and from the comfort of home.